welcome to Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. We are live. Well, I'm live. These guys are live, but not live here in Huntsville, Alabama. All right. And we are at Fractal Brewing, which is a really awesome setup. And we've got a really nice space in uh, which to have the show or host our audience, I should say. And uh, Tom and Glenn are giant heads on either side of me on large screens. So just to kind of get things rolling, our, our host is uh, Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we're really, uh, we've really been enjoying, or I should say I've been enjoying my time with them. I'm here with them this week doing some events. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and jump into tonight's show. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I, I uh, serve a church in the Pacific Northwest uh, in Vancouver, Washington, just outside of Portland, Oregon. And uh, Portland's motto is keep it weird over in Vancouver, literally. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything that I made up. The motto is keep it normal, keep it normal in Vancouver. And I'm glad to be in a place where people value normal. Anyway, uh, I've written a few books, and I mentioned just one of them a, a moment ago. But uh, rather than spend any more time on me, why don't we kind of go around the horn? Let's go to you, Tom. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell, tell everybody here where you are. And, uh, you know, the normal stuff. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Tom Price. I'm a teacher. I teach uh, systematic theology, Christian ethics, and philosophy. Uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary is one of the places I teach. I'm in the Atlantic Northeast, <laughs> which is... Uh, yeah, some place uh, that no one a, mentions that, it talks about that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And uh, it's it's a, it, as they 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 used to. Well, I used to hear a lot when I when I lived in UK. It's it's a wee bit chilly here. <laughs> yeah, right. So what is the um, temperature there? Because it's, it's actually it's actually kind of cold here in Huntsville today. So what's the temperature there? Yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, I think nine degrees is how cold it will get tonight. And I believe there's a little wind chill going along with it. And this has been a little trend lately, so uh, so yeah, yeah, that's 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 our winter norm right now. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So, so Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself and where are you? Uh, I am Glenn Sunshine. I am a retired history professor, ministry associate with Reflections Ministries in Atlanta, and a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I am in South Bend, Indiana, where it is a balmy 18 degrees. All right. <laughs> now, actually, right here, I think we're in like the 30s, but everybody here is like uh, freaking out. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we got a fun show today, and it's your, your day, Glenn. Uh, so introduce the subject and get us rolling. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, going to be talking a bit about an article from Touchstone. Uh, I wasn't able to get the exact date for this. I think they pulled it out of their archives and I found it online. Uh, it's called The Fairy Tale Wars. It's by uh, Vegan Garoyan. And uh, I think it raises a, a number of really interesting uh, questions that would be worth exploring. So he starts off with the observation that people who study fairy tales in academia generally don't like them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Academics ruin everything, even children's stories. Right. Well, I mean, the, the opening sentence, uh, let's just start there. Why is it that so many of the people who make fairy tales their business, who one might say rule the roost in that business, are keen to persuade us that the worth or commendableness of these venerable stories is diminished by their age, impaired by old prejudices, that our enlightened up-to-date standards refute and mustn't tolerate. Okay, so in, in other words, the, these people study fairy tales and they look at them and they say, oh no, no, we, we, we can't have this. We've got to reject a lot of the core elements of these fairy tales. And uh, uh, Goroyan gives three reasons for this. Um, and he cites a couple of examples. But the first one is what we could call a sort of a secular outlook. And the reason why that's important is that the fairy tales have embedded in them, a lot of them have a lot of religion, a lot of Christianity, 
a lot of traditional morality, those kinds of things. And there's this mistaken notion that if you're going to be an academic, you need to approach things from a purely secular perspective as if that were neutral. When in point of fact, it's at best indifferent to religion and at worst actively hostile to it. So naturally, these people who are trying to be neutral and not take any kind of, uh, make any kind of religious statement or stand aren't going to like the fairy tales because they are, they have religious faith embedded in them. And that brings us to sort of the second one, which is that they really don't like the world that is described there. They don't like the the environment. You know, Tolkien talked about one of the great benefits of, of fairy tales is it allows you to connect with what he called the totally other. It's a different world. It's a, a, a very radically different place. Um, it's got uh, fantasy elements, all of these kinds of things. And he notes that a lot of these academics just find the world that they describe really distasteful. He quotes um, him as saying, uh, when I think of the world out of which Snow White, the juniper tree, the goose girl, Hansel and Gretel, and many others came, I shudder and I am grateful that I am not asked to be good, to be me, to be alive in that world. So that, that, that's a quote from one of these despisers right. of te- fairy tales. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a guy by the name of Sale, um, who, Roger Sale, who is a, um, uh, you know, he's now passed away, but he was a recognized expert in children's literature. Right, right. <laughs> now, C.S. Lewis referred to this, I think, quite accurately as chronological snobbery. Right, yeah. Another person that, I, that I, we all know is Tony Esselin. And Tony was canceled at Providence College for basically being too Christian, which is <laughs> the Catholic yeah. uh, co- college. And anyway, but, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that they came for him uh, on was this, you know, fact that he was an authority in the Western tradition. And Tony w- would say, you guys are interested in learning about other cultures. I'm an authority on cultures in the past. They're as different from your culture as the cultures you claim to be interested in. So why don't you kind of consider the stuff that I teach equally valuable? And they they let him go. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm getting now. Tony's fine, and he's uh, you know uh, now uh, happily employed at another Catholic college that actually believes in Catholicism. But the uh, you know this is kind of thing that we deal with a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, the uh, Gryan uh, continues in the same vein. He says, you know, it, it, it's not just the Brothers Grimm. It's all kinds of other fairy tales that fall into this category. And he says, they imaginatively make present a world that Sales judges to be virtually subhuman, a world in which he believes individuals are gravely hindered from becoming agents of goodness or secure in their own identity. Notice the emphasis on identity, which is one of the big things in, in worldview today. Uh, that's a whole bunch of shows right there. But he, if, if this is true of fairy tales, isn't it also true of things like the Iliad, the Aeneid, the Divine Comedy? Heck, isn't it even true of the Bible? It's a very different world. And if it doesn't affirm what we want it to affirm, well, we really need to do something about that, don't we? You know, that seems to be the attitude of the academics. Yeah, and a lot of people do do something about that. Uh, I, I know that one of the things that Groin gets into in the article is this revisionist approach uh, and bodlerization. I know you want to get into that, so uh, I don't know if we're getting too far ahead in this in your in your presentation, but I... next that's the next point. Okay, well, go for it. Well, there's a. Uh, well, I had a quick quick point before we do it. I, I mean, it, there was, there's a similar th- trend that happens likewise in theology, and th- that as as things uh, begin to, um, well, as so- societies begin to change their emphasis, those things that are distinct and other than than what is is now familiar to it 
tend to be looked at strangely and they, they want to domesticate these things. They want to make them fit within the furniture of their own living room, this kind of thing. The, the making, you know, putting, putting God in the dock, if you will. And, and so there's the same thing it looks like here going on, you know, in, in the shared world that, you know, previous generations and, and stories that, uh, that talk and emphasize things that have, we have some distance from, even though I don't think we really do, um, but we think we do, that's the chronological snobbery, um, we, we tend to want to um, bring into a safe living room kind of warmth where anything that goes outside of that threatens or questions our, um, you know, sense of self, pride, comfort, security, we want to, we want to do something to make, to change it. Well, I think, you know, kind of related to that, Tom, but almost moving in the other direction, I think, I think the fairy tales actually threaten these people. Yeah. And uh, because they call into question many of their commitments. Yeah. And so they want That's to, right. uh, you know, sort of redirect the sort of the moral content to reinforce whatever the agenda is. And we all know what the agenda yeah. is. Uh, and they ruin the stories. I mean, they, they, they take these marvelous yeah. enchanted tales and turn them into just propaganda and uh, make them <laughs> dull and kind of dumb. Anyway, uh, yeah. we, can, we can rant on that a little more later. But uh, Glenn, I know you want to move ahead on, on that theme. No. Um well, the, the, the third point that he raises is, is one that's near and dear to all of our hearts, um, mm -hmm. although we haven't talked about it for a while, and that's the problem of historicism. Right. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the fairy tales are attacked because they are simply products of a different time and a different culture, and they reflect that time and culture, and times have changed. And so these stories, in unrevised form, are unacceptable or even dangerous to present to children. So mm -hmm. the solution is to revise them, is to update them, is to make them reflect the values and mores of the present. And they justify this by noting that the stories changed over time anyway, so why not? Um, mm -hmm. Though they changed organically, they didn't change because somebody came in and, and said, no, I want this message here. You know, that's, that's the other uh, side of that. Uh, the, the, the biggest culprit in this, of course, is Disney. Yeah, that's right. I was going to bring that up. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people uh, are introduced to fairy tales through the bodlerized versions that they have from, you know, Walt Disney. And then they actually read the Brothers Grimm and man, the stories are kind of grim. <laughs> you know, there are people getting cut up and eaten and all kinds of stuff. And uh, probably a lot of moms uh, approve of this process of kind of getting the blood out or getting the this, this scary stuff out. But uh, people like Tolkien and uh, particularly C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis had no patience for Disney. Uh, and I think I've, I've read some, some comments of, from Tolkien as well. They, they yeah. despised Disney. Now, this is kind of a shock for a lot of folks who have warm feelings for, like, well, the <laughs> stories they, they got from Disney. What, what's really remarkable about that, and this is one of the things I wanted to get into, is that the early Disney stories, if you look at Snow White, if you look at Cinderella, they stick pretty closely to the original stories. When you get to the stuff from the last 40 years or so, they don't. I mean, Snow White is, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, Tolkien had a lot of things he didn't like about it, but at least it kept the basic storyline the same. You know, Cinderella kept the same basic storyline. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, these cla the, the Disney classics, the, the really old ones, didn't do too badly there. Since Disney died, however, the Disney Corporation has moved in a really different direction. So if you read Beauty and the Beast, Belle was not a, a, a young feminist. Gotcha. <laughs> right. <laughs> neither, was, neither, for that matter, was Ariel in, in The Little Mermaid. Right. <laughs> you know, but 
if, if you watch Disney, there are certain themes that they keep hammering. And, uh, and they adjust them a little bit. But overall, what you're going to be seeing are, uh, are things that have the same characters and a few same elements of plot from the original, but are very different in tone, very different in spirit, and very different in the message that they're designed to convey. Right. I think, you know, when, it, when, when we, when we uh, think about that, you know, the, the thing that occurs to me is what do we do about that? I mean, we're talking about this massive corporation that I just heard uh, gave the, the, their uh, CEO a $35 million raise last week. You know, so these guys have a lot of money to throw around. And Probably, I'm guessing they did that because he basically fired Ryan Johnson, but that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I guess the thing is, is you know, what can we do, uh, you know, that would be helpful in terms of uh, introducing people to the real stuff. I don't know if you want to get into that. Maybe that's something we can get into a little later, but something that comes to my mind anyway when we, when we talk about this. Yeah, what, what I'd actually like to do a little bit more with right now before we move into that direction is talk about this bowdlerization, this, this um, tendency to distort or to rewrite or, well, I would say demolish the stories. Right. Um, it, it's really extreme in a lot of the Disney ones. Um, the Little Mermaid's got a totally different ending, for example, than the original. It makes a totally different point. Uh, he, he even does it, uh, the, uh, Groyan also talks about this in connection with books. So, for example, he gives an example of a, what he says is a beautifully illustrated edition of The Ugly Duckling. Except it turns the story from a meditation on beauty into an anti-bullying book. Right. <laughs> you know, again, contemporary issues. Right. Um, you even see this, I would argue, in the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay. Where, um, you know, uh, where, and this is something we talked about before, in order to suit modern sensibilities, you have to change fundamentally a number of the characters um, because, well, we can't portray some, we can't portray Aragorn as someone who is confident, who is assured, who is moving forward, fully intending to marry Arwen, who is, who is good, who is courageous, who is noble in every sense of the word. We can't do that because we don't have a cultural imagination that allows that kind of character anymore. Right. Yeah, and um, if we if we actually stuck to the script, in other words, the story, um, you know, we might be accused of things uh, like patriarchy or something. I don't know. Yeah, or you know, Far Faramir is a more extreme example. I mean, we we see this all over. Is kind of the point. Right. Right. So we can have uh, strong female characters who have no character flaws. Uh, and and strong male characters must be weakened. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that actually reflects a larger cultural sort of, sh or sort of uh, agenda where in order for women to succeed many times, uh, it's believed that men must be in some sense compromised. They have to be uh, weakened in order for that to happen. Anyway, that's a, so, uh, maybe that's a subject for another show. But... Um, yeah. Well, Tom, were you going to say something? Well, I was going to say it's interesting because there, there is this kind of also this dimension of just strict moralizing of, of the stories. And and um, and and I think I mean, everything we, you know, t try to, you know, read and study, there's some kind of cultivation going on when we do it, you know, not just for enjoyment. Um, but when we, you know, have our children read these books and, and things like that, they're interesting. They're fun stories. They do introduce things, you know, creepy realities and dark sides of things. Um, and so there is this kind of um, spiritual dimension, if you will, that that really talks about the thick realities of life in ways that appeal to human imagination, children in particular, but all the way up. Um, I think that gets really narrowed down with these kind of critical readings and, and appropriations 
or these retellings to become very palatable to the sensitive adult mind. And, and I think there is something in that spiritual um, dimension and, and the imagination that, that Lewis and Tolkien and these people who really appreciated this um, emphasized, which these other people simply don't have an imagination for. And, um, and, and that's kind of worth unpacking, I think, a little bit. Yeah, I'd like to think a little about a couple of things related to that. I think uh, one of those things is, well, Bodler, who was this guy? We've been using that term, Bodlerization. Maybe uh, you can kind of <laughs> fill us in, uh, Glenn. I don't know if you've got that uh, kind of in your sort of... Uh, I, don't, I don't have that one on the top of my head, sorry. Well, I, my understanding Bodlerized. is... Yeah, my, my belief is, is that he was a uh, kind of a person who was known for kind of bleaching stories of, the, of their color or... or you know, sort of toning down the flavor of, of the stories in order to make them more palatable to sensitive people. This reminds me of a, of a conversation I had with a guy named Jim Kruger. Jim Kruger is a writer for DC Comics. He was actually one of the writers for the new uh, Eternals movie, I think, it came, a Marvel movie. Anyway, he's actually writing a story about a friend of mine. But he, uh, uh, when I was writing my book, uh, The Purloin Boy, uh, we had a conversation, and I, and I mentioned him. I said, you know, Jim... You know, I, I know that the themes in my story are going to be kind of, well, they're going to unnerve particularly some moms. And, and Kruger just cut me off and said, ignore the moms. Just ignore the moms. <laughs> and moms, if you make stories palatable to moms, teenage boys are going to look for something, you know, something someplace else. And I actually think that's one, perhaps one of the reasons why a person like H.P. Lovecraft has become... Uh, you know, sort of a fascinating figure for a lot of young men because uh, they're introduced to some things through Lovecraft, and I think the sublime is uh, one of those things. Uh, you don't actually need H.P. Uh, Lovecraft to introduce you to the sublime. The fairy tales, in certain respects, were sublime. Maybe we, maybe we can talk a little bit about that too. But anyway, those are a couple of thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, um, one of the things that... Um that uh, Garoyan talks about is related to the sublime. He talks about how in these new adaptations of the stories, um, well, let me read it. Even when the characters in Disney's adaptations carry the same names as in the traditional tales and inhabit a world furnished with the accoutrements of another time and place, they lack the atmosphere of otherness or mystery that the written tales impart. Instead, the characters mimic modern speech patterns and relate to one another in all too familiar ways. Okay. So, and that's where he gets into female protagonists uh, turning into um, uh, young feminists. Right. Yeah, you know, one of the things here, uh, you know, that comes to my mind when it comes to uh, our experience of fairy tales is the artwork that accompanies those fairy tales. And, you know, the, the Disney aesthetic is sort of like Velveeta cheese. It's, it's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of made to be easily digested, smooth and sort mm -hmm. of creamy and no, uh, nothing that would uh, sort of like chip your teeth or give you any kind of heartburn, <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, when we think about... Uh, illustrators in the past, I'm thinking of Arthur Rackham in particular, you know, I think many of us, when we think about, you know, these stories, we think about someone like Rackham, who had no problem scaring a kid, you know, with his illustrations. And actually, Michael Haig, who's referred to here with, with the Hans Christian Andersen, you know, ugly duckling, he's kind of a contemporary, uh, you know, sort of uh, in the spirit of Arthur Rackham. So it's a little disappointing that, you know, he's, he's kind of uh, bleached the story a little bit or made it less, uh, I guess, uh, objectionable. But anyway, uh, I think maybe some of the, some of the you know, the, the things that are going on in terms of the old, you know, sort of uh, presentation of the stories had a lot to do with that. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, no, I, it, I, I was just kind of thinking, I mean, I was, I was thinking along with it, I mean, not related to the depiction of them, because I, I, I think you do see that as well. Um, I mean, you, you just com- you kind of look at just any kind of illustrative work um, prior to that which is palatable to to the contemporary, and uh, other than the real ugly artwork that that tries to kind of, you know, get at some kind of sense of reality in a very reductionistic way. I mean, I, I think you you have that that same disposition going on. Um, the, the, this attempt to make something you know, fit, fit the palette that is, it's just so narrowed down safe and only has the ideals that, that are so fragile looking at a crass depiction of the story as it's told somehow threatens the, the whole. Um, and it really, I think that point of historicism is a good, good point. I mean, historicism, this is one of the things I've come to find by it. Although it puts all this great emphasis on the embodied nature and the historical nature of things, the drama of, of agents in history, it's, about, it's, it's one of the most fragile ways in which you can, you can understand yourself and other things. And you have to buffer yourself in the now because everything that went before is now unsafe. You know, it's, it's like... And, and then in their own in their own conception is you didn't come about but apart from that very history. So why has it become so scary to you? It's a it's a part of the story that brought you and your ideals about, right? If it's moving towards some kind of process. So yeah, there there is this um it's it's like cutting off the, you know, cutting off the limb that holds up, you know, the parts of the branches. I mean, this is what gave you this. This is where you came to and where you're bearing fruit, but you're cutting that off. And it, and it, it reminds me of the similar things in the Enlightenment where you rip yourself up out of tradition, out of, out of real history, and then kind of uh, try to put your, I, yourself in this kind of safe, ideal place. But it's so fragile because it's grounded in, in something temporal and contingent rather than eternal and sustained. Yeah, a couple of things come to mind with that, Tom. You know, one of the things is the reaction of the, you know, romanticism to the Enlightenment. And that's really where we have, you know, guys like the Brothers Grimm going out into the yeah. hinterlands to dig up yeah. all these old scary stories. <laughs> you know, so yeah, there, yeah. there's this, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's that. But also when we think of historicism, <laughs> it's a kind of flat way of thinking uh, we lose the transcendent, but we also lose uh, the hellish, you know, the, 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 yeah. the scary stuff beneath the surface. So, you know, it's just yeah. us now. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're not accompanied by angelic uh, uh, nor demonic uh, presences, yeah. uh, which had a way yeah. of kind of making the world at least more interesting. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, sure. but, but here we are. But I think it also had a way of... Uh, of toughening, toughening us up, uh, kind of mentally, and also sending us uh, upward uh, prayerfully, you know, because if you really are kind of walking through the woods and you're afraid that you're about to be eaten by an ogre, it has a way of kind of like getting your attention and, you know, and focusing it on God. <laughs> Say, God, please help me get through this forest. Now, there's, there's another part of this that is, I think, really worth uh, thinking about, and that's the, that the critics, you know, I mentioned before the issue of identity that was so important to this guy. The, the, the critics really look at things on the basis of individualism and very much presentism. Um, yeah. Whereas they're ignoring the real wisdom. I mean, you know, this is a problem of modernity generally, but they ignore the real wisdom of tradition. You know, as Jordan Peterson points out, there are a lot of things that we believe or that, that we have historically believed because they've worked for the last 10,000 years. And yet we're jettisoning, jettisoning them now. Because why? Um, Dickens comments about this kind of thing. Whoever alters the fairy tales to suit his own opinions, whatever they are, is guilty of an act of presumption and appropriates to himself what does not belong to him. You know, there, there's a sense in which 
there's a reason why these tales have stood the test of time. And yeah, granted, they evolve slowly and organically over time, not by wholesale rewriting them. Um, but, there, but there's a reason why these tales have survived. There's a reason why so many of these things have been classics. And yet what they're doing is just throwing out all of those reasons. So you, you brought up Dickens, and that's great. John Ruskin is another, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a critic of this tendency. And I think very often uh, writers, storytellers, I should say, uh, actually do a better job of honoring the stories that were told in the past and uh, sort of working with them than the critics. Although there, are a kind, there is a kind of phenomenon today where we see a certain kind of contemporary author who uh, kind of makes his or her living by churning out the kinds of stories that we don't like. <laughs> but, but, you know, when we talk about Ruskin or, or Dickens uh, and others in, the, in their spirit, uh, they, they, they do a really good job of honoring those who came before, which is an interesting thing to think about. There is a kind of writer uh, who does like being part of the great tradition, and then there's a, there's a writer who wants to be utterly original all the time and often is slavishly sort of the uh, uh, sort of, uh, of spoke speaking for the, the spirit of the age, if you know what I mean. They're not actually original at all. They just uh, are animated by that spirit that just kind yeah. of is, you know, ubiquitous everywhere around. And it's, the, and it's the, the man or woman who's willing to defy that spirit, actually get in touch with the tradition and uh, who has a better chance of surviving, like we see with C.S. Lewis or, or, or Tolkien, who I believe are both going to be part of the great tradition going forward. I, I wouldn't be surprised if people are reading them like we read Homer, you know, in a thousand years, that kind of thing. But anyway, just a couple of thoughts. There, I think there is this, uh, and, it, you know, this is another kind of overspill of people that, who think that they are autonomous and transcending um, the finite conditions of, of history and everything else by being original and novel. Um, the problem is they're, all they're doing is imbibing, or, well, they're, they're, they're just participating in a tr tradition that thinks being new and original and everything else. And you could say, going right back to Kant, I, I had a fun, fun uh debate in a pub in Oxford one time with a young chap who, when he heard me quoting a bunch of different figures, he goes, those are great other people's ideas. How about something original? To which I said, well, that's a great Kantian idea as well. <laughs> <laughs> this whole well, notion you know, of just... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I remember that was a big breakthrough for me intellectually when I, when I realized that there was the tradition of non-traditionalism. And uh, yes. that, and that many people are sort of stuck in that tradition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it reminds me of something I read once. Everything that's written about Shakespeare today is either unoriginal or wrong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right, right. That's good stuff. Yeah. And, anyway, so carry us forward here, Glenn. Okay, well, in connection with this, I thought you mentioned Ruskin. I thought I'd read the quote from Goroyan on him. Uh, he says, Every fairy tale worth recording at all is the remnant of a tradition possessing true historical value. Historical, at least insofar as it has naturally arisen out of the mind of a people under special circumstances and risen not without meaning nor removed altogether from their sphere of religious faith. And Groyan adds, for Ruskin, religion and tradition are companionate in a special way, and fairy tales evidence this by the, manner, by the manners they bring to life and the mystery they disclose. And yet, all of that gets thrown out in the modern retellings. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, um, Christopher Tolkien objected to the movie version of The Lord of the Rings because he said they've just made it an adventure story. Right. Hmm. Lord of the Rings is far more than an adventure story. Right. Um, and yet you lose the depth when you 
well, it, it, it's probably inevitable in a film of a book as long and complex as Lord of the Rings. I don't know how you would avoid that problem, you know, being fair here. But when you're working with fairy tales, it's kind of a different matter. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, in, in you know, Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, he does say that the medium of film, which he, you know, sort of, you know, uh, relates to drama, uh, he said it's it's good for certain things, but not fairy tales. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that he, uh, you know he he more or less dismissed the ability of drama to to convey what he was trying to convey through literature. You know, which is an interesting thing to think about. Certain media uh, are good for certain things. Uh, you can't expect mm -hmm. uh, film to do everything. I think that's a. Right. I think we actually live in a time where people think that if you write a book, you're not truly uh, successful until it becomes a movie. You know, that's so like, yeah, I've yeah. actually had people say that to me. You know, like, uh, don't you yeah. want your book to become a movie? It's, it's sort of like it would be the greatest compliment <laughs> in the world. Now, I wouldn't mind the money. <laughs> but, but the, you know, this idea that uh, somehow uh, every novel is actually just a, a script for a film uh, or a, an attempt to cr make a script for a film uh, is losing, I think, something really valuable, which is, you know, novels are good yeah. for doing certain things. Films are good for doing other things. But yeah. um, kind of related to all this is, I guess, um, this whole matter of uh, what we can see uh, kind of as the product of a people. That's one of the things that fascinates me. We don't know. There, there's no, like, a, a author that we can say, oh, uh, you know, you're talking about Snow White. Well, that's John Dixon, you know, or something like that. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's been handed down to us, and it's rich and deep, but it's the product of, an, of a cultural outlook. You know, it's not just some author sitting at a desk with a pen. Uh, this is a story that comes down over time, and we have no clue, you know, how it was composed or came to be what it is until more, you know, more recent times where we can document that kind of stuff. But I also think, you know, when we think about folk music, a lot of folk music, which is tremendously rich and expressive, and uh, we can't identify, you know, the artists, I mean, the, the composers. Uh, it's, it's the product of, of a people, which is something I think worth considering a little bit. Yeah, I think it it is is definitely connected to. Um, I think I mean you know I mean the, uh, reading it as a theologian, um, you know I, I would say it's definitely part of that echo of creation in the way in which we in many ways react to that, um, and then also the fact that it's a fallen creation and there's there's um, signs pointing to hope of, of a renewal of creation, right? And so, so there are liturgical patterns, uh, I think, of, of, of all cultures that you see enacted that, you know, define a kind of uh, the consciousness of a people and, and, and the identity of a people and in which um, that are very spiritual, very deep, handed to generation to generation, which are shaped generationally, not trying to just by, by rewriting and making them palatable so much as oftentimes they're just spoken or sung. Um, the church did this with its early theology. Those were hymns. But you see, like, you think of uh, the, the um, Spanish writer uh, Lorca, Federica Lorca. Uh, he wrote these poems, Deep Song, um, in Spanish, the the rhythm he he basically studied the rhythmic structures of the Andalusian um, culture, where you had Byzantium with the the kind of Islamic, and and some of the other cultures come together, and there's this rhythmic liturgical pattern which can which spills right over into the poetry and the telling of it, and these things were just carried from generation to generation. They were the culmination of different people bumping up against each other. And, and so when you see certain cultures still expressing certain aspects of these things to this very day, you see how deep this stuff is. And so to lift ourselves up out of that and disconnect from, from our, connect, our his real historical connection to our origins, um, which, you know, I, I, I think that, that, is, uh, that puts us in dangerous territory, but it really flattens our earth. 
Yeah, you know, and, and what's kind of intriguing about this or, you know, I, I, and frustrating is that here we have all these people who are cons- you know, sort of obsessed with identity, right? Yeah. Our ancestors didn't yeah. really worry about that. They, they, they were given yeah. their identities. <laughs> I'm they German, that's right. right. <laughs> so they they, 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 they like, handed, it, handed it on. Yeah, it was handed down to them, which yeah. is what tradition means, to hand over. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 this process of sort of connect, disconnecting ourselves from uh, a people pres- presents us with this existential uh, crisis. Now I got to yeah. choose my identity. And then, you know, yeah. how is that accomplished? Well, I identify with my desires, uh, and these other people seem to have similar desires. So that's not my group, you know. Right. Except, except notice how much DNA um, and anal- genetic analysis to tell you where you came from, how big that yeah. is, yeah, or how yeah. big Ancestry.com is. Yeah. People are really interested in their roots and yet, oddly enough, they want to know where they came from so they can reject it and, and self-identify. <laughs> it's, it's a bizarre thing. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, what, what, it, what it is, is it's, it, yeah, it is a realization, of course, I think that, you know, we kind of bit a fruit with the Enlightenment and we become alienated something from something fundamental about us. And we don't know how. This is why even in theology, there's all this retrieval and it's the only way we know how to get back. Um, because we we can't just kind of reimmerse ourselves as if this enlightenment didn't alienate us from it, and so um, and and you look at even even in theology, look at all the language return to language of participation, which was gutted with the enlightenment, which was central to 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 uh, primitive society's philosophy, but especially to the Christian interpretation of things. Um, and so I, and there was an interesting book. You, you may have uh, heard of it recently. It was by uh, Antonio Lopez and uh, Javier Prades. It was Retrieving Origins in the Claim of Multiculturalism. And what it's trying to get at is that this emphasis on multiculturalism is really more an expression of the Enlightenment and its dis- disentanglement. It, it's us choosing than it is really having an identity that is connected to those various cultures. You know, I lived in Cambridge, you lived in Oxford, you know, I've spent a lot of time in, you know, diverse, hip, cool places. And what you see with the diversity cult is a kind of superficial sort of uh, thing uh, where, where, yeah, I mean, the color of our skin or maybe the, the, our, our taste uh, when it comes to food and music is cosmopolitan, but you get beneath the surface, and all these people think alike. They they have yeah. no, they have no diversity of opinion at all. I mean, they they are as homogenous as you could possibly be, and uh, yes. it, it's a it's a fraud. Oh, I got another beer. Yeah. I was just kidding. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it becomes it becomes very monochrome, and and you know one of the things that I always tell students that the difference between this kind of enlightenment. Um, substitute called, you know, the diversity cult or multiculturalism versus the real gift of, of difference um, is, is the real gift of difference is, is first of all, it, it's a reality. Um, but, but secondly, it's, it doesn't need to be competitive in a Christian vision of things because they're received as gift. And one of the things you'll find, I have found very much as a, someone who studied a lot of music, when you really get at the roots of a, a, almost every culture's earliest forms of folk music, there is almost a deep connection within all that variety. So it is almost, it, it is almost ready to receive the other. I mean, look, look at what happens with certain, you know, certain rhythms are connected with uh, kind of, of classical uh, four, five, one progressions and then adding different tones, you get jazz. And so there's a complement, there's improvisation within a kind. So it's the same thing, within the rich variety and gift of difference in creation, there is a way in which all that difference is, is harmonious and unified and qualifies and gives versus a competitive, superficial reduction of everything um, really, for it just really reduces it to to a superficial identity and a non 
something that doesn't contribute anything other than just its own display and desire for power. Yeah, yeah I, um, I like Celtic music, and I have run into a lot of people who do Celtic music mixed with Bulgarian music yeah. or mixed with Middle Eastern music. Or in one case, there was a group called Afro-Celtic Sound Machine, <laughs> where they mixed it with African stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah, there, there's something going on there. I mean, with, with yeah. the sound roots. I'd, I'd actually like to move to one other thing from this article. And he has a, a really interesting discussion at the very end of it, um, which I think was really what he wanted to get to in a lot of ways, on narrative and the, immor the moral imagination. So what he says is that the meaning that you get in fairy tales is not found in the, in the individual elements or in the individual characters. It's the story itself. The narrative itself is what provides the meaning. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, he, he, he talks about uh, rules for good behavior, things like that, that are, are in, embedded in here. But... Um, he brings up a number of points. I mean, obviously, there are lessons for how you should and should not behave in, in traditional fairy tales. But he also points out, C.S. Lewis says that fairy tales give us experiences we have never had. And thus, instead of commenting on life, can add to it. Because through the fairy tale, we experience things we didn't experience before. And the reason why that works is because the fairy tale appeals to our imagination. And Lewis at one point said that, uh, where is it here? Um, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. Mm. So as you are in these fairy tales, as you are imaginatively engaging in them, as you're having vicarious experiences that you didn't have before, you find meaning in the story, in, in everything else that, that surrounds it. Doesn't he quote Flannery O'Connor? Uh, At a couple of points, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes people will say, give me the, give me the point. What's the point of the story? And I think her, her response was, the story is the point. <laughs> Read the story. Yeah. I recently had a person ask me to summarize my book on Bombadil, and I said, no! <laughs> yeah. The summary is the book. Flannery O'Connor, the whole story is the meaning, because it is an experience, not an abstraction. Right, right. I, I quoted something from uh, Roger Lancet Green. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, he said something he, regarding Tolkien's uh, Smith of Whitton Major that Tolkien uh, uh, was pleased to hear. He's, uh, it had to do with this very thing. He said, uh, concerning maybe our desire to kind of get to the point. And he said, to seek the meaning, uh, in other words, apart from the story, is to cut open the ball in search of the bounce. Obviously, what happens when you cut open a ball in search of the bounce is you no longer have a ball. You've got half a ball. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, uh, you know, serve you know, the purpose of a rubber ball any longer. It's, a, it's, a, it's something to throw away at that point. Uh, you know, so there's something about the story itself, just kind of getting into the story, enjoying the story uh, for, it to, for it to have its effect. To, to rephrase something that uh, the philosopher Hillary Put Putnam once said about philosophy, um, any story, I'll use story in this case, that uh, can be put in a nutshell belongs in a nutshell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And I, I, I think that that's kind of right with philosophy. It's right with, with uh, stories right. as well. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I think lazy people want us to do these summaries and really, we're not doing them any favor by doing that. Now, I, I know that, you know, when you're trying to help somebody kind of get into a subject, it's, you know, it, it's valuable to make the process uh, work for them. But, uh, you know, if, if, if we were to do what they want us to do, we would just kind of live by cliff notes. We would never have stories anywhere. We just have, you know, a library full of cliff notes. Maybe <laughs> cliff notes are things that people don't think about anymore, but we used to use those to cheat in college. We 
<laughs> yeah, we know of Wikipedia entries. Um, <laughs> the the um, the the thing about imagination that I think is really important here is he talks a lot about moral imagination. And this is, again, a subject that we've talked about before on the show, but I think it was also another essay by Garoyan I was using when we, we got there. But I want to read a paragraph from this. This is um, on the last page, really. Uh, in his own essay on fairy tales from 1908, G.K. Chesterton maintains that a single idea, quote, runs from one end of fairy tales to the other. The idea that peace and happiness can only exist on some condition. This truth is the bedrock of morality. It is not only the core of nursery tales, but the core of ethics. The failures to do from the start what is right or what is needed is the most ancient of humanity's memories. In biblical mer memory, this is the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. The serpent appeals not first to the reason, but to the imagination. Imagine, it says to the first couple, you can be gods if you eat the fruit of that tree. The idolatrous imagination triumphs in the garden, and it has been the source of much human tragedy ever since. Yeah, I think that that's a really powerful statement. I think sometimes people, well-meaning people say, well, let's just not have an imagination anymore. Let's just kill the imagination because we're afraid of its misuse. When I think yeah, that... Yeah, I've heard that often. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that often with, with even in Calvinist circles, you know, the, because the mind, the imagination is an idol making factory. Therefore, we need to basically cut it off rather than renew and redeem it. <laughs> right. And so what you're left with is simply propositions. Uh, this is true. This is true. This is true. And it kind of sets our kids up for seduction, I think, when somebody yeah. who can actually tell a decent story, but maybe has a. Uh, uh, in a you know sort of something like what occurred in the garden going on with the story, we ought to help our 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 young people uh, with the art of discerning, you know what's going on in the story and love learn to love good stories stories that call forth the kinds of virtue, goodness that we want to see developed in a Christian. Yeah, and, but, but we have to be careful here because a lot of the things that pass as Christian children's literature are excessively in-your-face and preachy. Yeah, sanitized as well. Yeah, and sanitized. What we need to be thinking about is how to tell good stories. C.S. Lewis once said that what we don't need are more Christian writers. What we need are more good writers who are Christians. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, so what we need aren't necessarily things that, you know, the typical Christian film that slaps you in the face with the gospel. You know, that, <laughs> that, that, that's not what we need. What we need are good films that are anchored in truth. Right. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the films, uh, you know, that was uh, produced in the last maybe 20 years that I think is... Uh, suffused with not only Christian imagery, but has a profoundly, I think, theologically sound point to make, is a film that would disturb a lot of people. Uh, and that's Gran Torino with, the, with uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, everything about that film on the surface seems too rough, too, uh, I guess, uh, kind of sort of edgy. But if you have an eye for what's actually happening in the story, the story is the gospel, uh, what's going on in the story and how the various characters in the story and the role that Clint Eastwood plays in the story, uh, can't, you can't really miss it when you, when you have an eye for it. Uh, but maybe that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, I, although I wouldn't recommend that necessarily for kids. But here's performing a moral imagination. Once you got yeah. one, it works. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it, it would greatly expand the vocabulary of a lot of kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 for some, I guess. <laughs> um, um, 
But um, I mean, and, you know, and again, not a kid's story, but but also the I mean, other good stories like uh, the one about the unforgiven, because even if you're not dealing with a redemptive story, you're dealing with the ramifications of someone struggling with justice and morality and these things, the, the, the things that human creatures uh, deal with in a fallen world that that echoes forth for some resolve to the injustices that are there and that point to. Um, something that that is resonating in us, which is true to which the gospel reality um, is, is attesting to and its fulfillment and dealing with it. So, I mean, anything that is that is able to capture the levels of reality, um, even imaginatively and 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 uh, what often look like they're not ordinary experiences but extraordinary you know certain kinds of you know elves and and everything else um the these have ways of of penetrating the rich fabric of creation and also capturing something of the groaning of creation as it it longs for its redemption um and i and i this is why i think you know we should we you know, all all these the, the rich stories of of the world are are worth I- investing in and not sanitizing, um, but also recognizing that there are echoes there that that can complement the gospel. Um, and then there are obvious. I think the deviations are the ones that that try to suppress through this narrowing and um, making everything about my present identity and ideals. That that's the stuff that distorts the kind of uh, truth that these things can can convey on all these different levels and and uh, teach us. You know, I was having a conversation just the other day about this thing, uh, this very thing. We were talking about curriculum, and uh, I was talking to this person about you know the 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 drive that we see in you know various uh, educational institutions to include new things or diversify the canon. And uh, I think the problem isn't so much that we are trying to diversify the canon as much as we have made diversity in the canon the only thing we're up to, if if you get what I'm saying. You know, so there are a lot of great stories that come out of the East, that come out of the Native American experience, that come out of the, you know, Africa and so forth. But they're great not because... Uh, they're they're different than what you can get from the West. They're great because they're in touch with the truth. So if, if the if the object yeah. if the object is to to know the truth, then we should look for it wherever it's to be found. You know. So if mm-hmm. there's a great story that we find in Africa that tells us something really valuable, let's bring it into the canon. But let's not bring it into the canon just because it's from Africa. You right. get my point. Yeah, yeah there, there's a reason why traditionally we have recognized certain works as works of great literature. You know, the Iliad isn't, isn't an adventure story. It's an explanation or an exploration, perhaps, of human nature, human vices, human virtues, all of those kinds of things. The Odyssey isn't a travelogue. You know, it, it's doing more than that. The Aeneid, when you read uh, War and Peace, when you read Crime and Punishment, um, any of the Rush, great Russian novels, they're explorations of the big philosophical questions. They're, ex- they're explorations of universal human experiences. Granted, they're set in a particular time and place and culture and all of that sort of thing. But they're hitting on these themes that really affect everyone. Everyone, no matter what your culture, struggles with these issues. The same on on a kind of a different level, the same is true of classic fairy tales, which is why the bodlerization is not just inappropriate, it's vandalism. I mean, and, and what you're doing is not improving the story, you're not making it more relevant to their experience. What you're doing is you're depriving them of 
the traditional wisdom that's included in it and the exploration of themes that they may not directly relate to an evil uh, stepmother in the forest. But sooner or later, they're going to deal with people like that. And you're depriving them of their experience of doing that. Yeah, there there is a form of what I, I I talk about. You know, I've talked about in other shows when we dealt with presentism, in which people are basically oppressing and dominating these stories and these meanings under their presentist, self centered, limited vision of things, experience, desires, wants, and everything else. They have the advantage of being an agent right now of of trying to. S- suffocate the voice of that agent and they do it (laughs) or they stifle it or distort it or it and so they don't give and this this is one of the things that come grows out of the christian vision of things is because we believe in a communion of saints and we also because in christ all live we therefore can hear these as living voices that we have a responsibility as carl bart once said um to honor our parents our father and mothers of the past in such a way that we allow them to still speak and teach us. And I think that's, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Well, you know, you, what you're getting at is something, of course, that Jesus addressed, the, the Lord, with regard to, you know, the status of Abraham when he was, he was you know, inter, inter, he was interacting with the Sadducees. You know, he said that, you know, uh, Abra, you know God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning that uh, they're alive, <laughs> right? Yes, so, that's so right. You, when you when you oppress p- the, the the people who live before <laughs> us by uh, suppressing what they say, you're an oppressor, baby. Yeah. You're an oppressor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, yep. we should probably real oppression. <laughs> we should probably wrap this up because uh, we have an audience here who I'm sure has a few questions for us that uh, we're going to have kind of a bonus episode of questions. Uh, and uh, so why don't we wrap this up? Is there anything you want to say, Glenn, as we wrap up this episode before we segue into the question and answer time? No, I think I pretty much shot my wad here. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful well, statement. Glenn. <laughs> well, well let, let, just so we're clear, some of my students thought I was being um, off color there. <laughs> What, what, when you have muzzle-loading artillery, you would put in the gunpowder, a wad, and the cannonball. When you run out of cannonballs, the only thing that's left to shoot is the wad. That's where that comes we, from. we understood, Glenn, and thank you for that explanation. <laughs> somebody yeah, out there is going to is gonna complain. Anyway... <laughs> In Virginia, growing up, it meant something else, but I won't go there. <laughs> well, that's, that's the etymology. <laughs> it's a family program. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening to the family program <laughs> known as the Theology Podcast. We really appreciate your interest in the show and your support. We have a lot of folks who listen from all over the world. You know, we have listeners in Norway, in Sweden, in France, and we can kind of drill down and actually know what region in those places that these folks are from. It just blows our mind, you know, just three years ago when we were sitting in the corner pug in West Hartford, Connecticut, we wondered (laughs) if anyone was ever going to listen to us. But anyway, I thank you for being one of those people who do listen to us, and we appreciate you, and we appreciate all the financial support we get, we receive uh, from a lot of folks in different places. All the all those gifts help to make the show possible. We we don't take any money. We uh, we spend all that money on the costs uh, of producing the show and posting the, the episodes and all that. So thank you very much for that. Anyway, thanks a lot and goodbye for now. Bye bye.